The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement. Hello and welcome to the ASCO Guidelines podcast series brought to you by the ASCO Podcast Network, a collection of nine programs covering a range of educational and scientific content and offering enriching insight into the world of cancer care. You can find all the shows, including this one, at podcast.asco.org. My name is Brittany Harvey, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Jessica Geiger from Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Patrick Ha from the University of California, San Francisco, co-chairs on Management of Salivary Gland Malignancy, ASCO Guideline. Thank you for being here, Dr. Geiger and Dr. Ha. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. First, I'd like to note that ASCO takes great care in the development of its guidelines and ensuring that the ASCO conflict of interest policy is followed for each guideline. The full conflict of interest information for this guideline panel is available online with the publication of the guideline in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Geiger, do you have any relevant disclosures that are directly related to this guideline? No, I don't. And Dr. Ha, do you have any relevant disclosures that are related to this guideline? No, I do not. Thank you both. Then let's talk about some of the content of this guideline. So first, Dr. Geiger, can you give us a general overview of the purpose and the scope of this evidence-based guideline on the management of salivary gland malignancy? Sure. So salivary gland cancers, they're, they're relatively rare, and they encompass a wide variety of both histologies, but also biologic behaviors of cancers. This is a very multidisciplinary tumor. So surgeons, radiation oncologists, pathologists, medical oncologists, they all play an integral role in treating these patients. And the purpose of this, this guideline was to bring all of these disciplines together and to develop a as strong as possible evidence-based way of approaching the diagnosis of such cancers and then approaching it from all modalities of therapy, surgical, radiotherapy, systemic therapy, in a very evidence-based and organized fashion. Great. Then, as you just mentioned, this is a multidisciplinary guideline and it covers six different subtopics on the management of salivary gland malignancy, preoperative evaluation, surgical management, radiotherapy, systemic therapy, follow-up, and treatment options for recurrent and metastatic disease. I'd like to go through and review the key recommendations from each of those sections for our listeners. So first, Dr. Ha, what does the guideline recommend regarding preoperative evaluation for patients with salivary gland malignancy? Great. So I'd first like to start off by saying that you know, we were focusing on salivary gland malignancy. So again, these are tumors where we may not know the diagnosis, but we're suspicious of this being cancer as opposed to a benign tumor. So along those lines, there were many different imaging recommendations. Uh, First off, that some sort of imaging would be helpful if there's a suspicion of cancer. And then drilling down a little bit more specifically, if there's concern about bone involvement, then CT scan was recommended. If it was more of a concern about the soft tissue or perineural invasion or skull base invasion, then MRI was suggested. And we did spend some time focusing on the strength of and the importance of tissue biopsies, either with fine needle aspiration biopsy or core needle biopsy, as a real you know helpful tool to help uh, clinicians determine what sort of procedures and uh, care this patient might need. Additionally, you know, with the onset of uh, more understanding of the pathology and the markers, it was felt that using these these biopsies, these FNAs or core biopsies to perform either molecular or immunohistochemical studies could further help clarify what the diagnosis would be and thus lead to sort of more specific and defined treatment uh, subsequently. Mm -hmm. And then following those evaluation and imaging and biopsy recommendations, what are the key surgical recommendations? Yeah, so again, this is probably known to most people uh, that when it is considered resectable, the surgery is really the mainstay upfront uh, management option for these patients. We spent some time looking at the different types of surgeries and felt that, you know, it, it was a bit up to the discretion of the surgeon, but it depends on, you know, the location of it as to what type of surgery exactly needed to be done. But the idea is obviously we would want complete resection of it and margins where possible. And then we address the nodes and the ability for these cancers to sometimes spread regionally. And basically, if these are high risk or high grade cancers, um, specifically if there is things like the grade of the tumor itself, the type, 
and then whether there were other concerning features about it, then a neck dissection electively would be offered. If there were in positive disease, then the neck dissection definitely should be performed. And then there was discussion as well about the facial nerve and how to manage that, uh, wherein uh, the, the evidence mostly supported trying to preserve the facial nerve whenever possible. And then, you know, we did talk a little bit about the possibility of palliative resection, which can occur sometimes in the presence of distant metastatic disease upon presentation. And it was felt, again, that there is a palliative component to surgery if, if the metastatic disease didn't seem to be rapidly progressive or imminently lethal. So these are all, you know, the, the difficult decisions that we discussed uh, regarding surgery. Okay, thank you. Then, Dr. Geiger, how does this guideline address radiotherapy for patients with salivary gland malignancy? Well, as Dr. Ha mentioned, this is primarily a surgical disease. So most of the recommendations regarding radiotherapy involve in the postoperative setting. But if you look at the guideline, we have actually laid out 10 recommendations regarding radiation, and they have to be, they're, they're dependent on various factors with each cancer. So the histology of the disease, other tumor pathologic factors, such as, you know, T-stage, vascular lymphatic invasion, margin status, perineural invasion, all of that goes into the recommendation here. There's also considerations for what nodal basins to cover based on where the tumor is and even the type of radiation and, of course, the timing of radiation. All of that is important to be considered and all of those specific features are mentioned within the recommendations. Great. And then in addition to those radiotherapy recommendations, what's the role of systemic therapy for patients with salivary gland malignancy? Well, unlike the radiation section where I said we have 10 specific recommendations, we're limited with the evidence for the use of systemic therapy in the curative setting of these diseases. So one point that I will make is, again, we're very limited based on evidence. And this is what is driving such a guideline is evidence, evidence, evidence. And we just don't have it. Uh, There are several large studies that are ongoing, uh, but until those results flesh out, we were limited. And so our recommendations are based on the lack thereof and often are considered low quality or moderate strength of recommendation at best based on our expert panel. Basically, you know, outside of a clinical trial, we're not recommending the addition of radiosensitizing chemotherapy with post-op radiotherapy. Again, that can be contentious, especially in the clinical realm where there's a wide variety of biologic behaviors. So some of the more aggressive diseases, we know that oncologists are advocating for the use of chemotherapy, but again, the evidence is not there yet, and so we weren't able to make that informative within this guideline. And then we also, we also addressed you know, tumors that are expressing different markers like androgen receptor, HER2, and make a recommendation for the use of targeted therapy. Again, noting a lack of evidence for it outside of a clinical trial currently. Okay. Thank you for explaining the reasoning and the evidence behind those particular recommendations. So then for patients who have then completed treatment for salivary gland malignancy, Dr. Ha, what are the timelines and recommendations for follow-up for these patients? Well, so again, this is where, you know, the data are really not strong. And so you'll notice that pretty much all of these recommendations were informal consensus. But similar to the NCCN guidelines for general cancer follow-up, it was uh, believed by the panel that early follow-up more frequently and to sort of space that out over time was was important. And then, you know, there was an, an emphasis on some form of imaging often. And, you know, whether that be CT or MRI, uh, you know, was, was sort of up to the practitioner. And then perhaps for a couple of years after treatment, that might be important. It was also felt that, as, as everyone probably knows, that one of the areas where this, this may spread to distantly is in the lung. So getting some sort of chest imaging, you know, between years two and five would be important as well, just in case one can detect an asymptomatic yet potentially treatable metastasis. So again, a lot of, a lot of informal consensus, the idea is that we feel it's important to continue to follow these patients to, to look for signs of recurrence. And then, you know, whether that's with imaging or physical exam, you know, we thought that either would be an option. Definitely. 
And the last section of recommendations for this guideline is on recurrent or metastatic salivary gland malignancies. So what are those treatment options, Dr. Geiger? Well, like before, when we're talking about systemic therapy, again, informal consensus is sort of driving the majority of these recommendations, again, highlighting lack of strong evidence. That said, there are several different clinical situations that we address within these recommendations. So whether a patient presents with diffusely metastatic disease with a large tumor burden or oligometastatic disease where maybe just one or two local or regional areas have recurred. And so in that latter case, you could discuss with the patient, is it worthwhile to do some locally ablative therapy such as SBRT or uh, possibly a resection versus for more widely metastatic disease starting systemic therapy. Now, there's also a recommendation specifically for the histology adenoid cystic carcinoma, and that is based on studies that have been done with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And so there's some evidence for that outside of cytotoxic chemotherapy. And then we also make a mention, which is very important, again, on checkpoint inhibitors, but also on some of the targeted therapies doing next-generation sequencing looking for molecular markers that drive the the progression of these diseases and then subsequent targeted therapies for this. So we really try to encompass any and all particular situations that an oncologist may encounter with these diseases and offer some, some guidelines and recommendations regarding the appropriate management. Great. Thank you both for reviewing those key points of the recommendations. This guideline goes through a lot of content, and so it's interesting to hear more about what kind of those details are for each section. So, Dr. Ha, in your view, what is the importance of this guideline, and how will it impact clinicians? Well, I think that we realized we had a lot to to cover in you know just a, a short amount of time, and I, I think that we felt that it was while the data may not be as strong with you know full of randomized clinical trials as perhaps other disease subgroups, uh, we felt that it was important to organize what the current state of the data are because these are rare cancers, and there are some nuances between some of the histologies even that it may be difficult to keep up to date all the time. So organizing it into one document where it seemed like, you know, we have clearly delineated what areas we feel are, you know, common practice amongst experts and what areas actually do have some studies and and perhaps some deeper level of of understanding and and depth of studies would be important so that clinicians understood where it was that they could, you know, they have to be a little more creative in, in areas where they felt like, hey, we feel like this is important to do. So I think that that would be useful for clinicians. And I think also it provides a framework for future studies. Uh, meaning that, you know, we hope that whenever these get updated in, you know, five, 10 years, that that there will be more studies. Uh, but it also does, I think, help for those of us who are in the field to organize where those gaps are. So you can look at the guidelines and really understand, okay, these are the areas that we need better understanding of how to treat patients. Definitely. It's helpful to understand both where there is evidence and where there is no evidence um, and where informal consensus takes a role. So then finally, Dr. Geiger, how will these guideline recommendations affect patients? Well, when it comes to cancer treatment, there is a lot of fear in the unknown. And I feel that patients are always asking, am I doing the right things? Am I looking to make sure that I'm getting the best of care? And I think with any guideline, this one included, patients can rest assured that you know, they don't have to make the trip and travel to a large academic center necessarily, that they can feel comfortable knowing that their providers are following the data and following such guidelines that have been brought forth in one single document, even though patients aren't going to necessarily have this, this document at hand, you know, they can have confidence within their oncology team. And then I think they'll also benefit from, as Dr. Ha was saying, as medical professionals, being able to identify gaps and uh, bringing forth clinical trials. That's the only way that we're going to be able to move this field forward, particularly in such a rare disease with many histologies as salivary gland malignancies. And so while being treated in a regional oncology office or a community oncology office 
you know, maybe their provider will then recommend clinical trials that are open and have that additional opportunity for patients if they so desire. So knowing that they're getting great standard of care based on evidence, but then also the opportunity to create new evidence for us to better treat patients in the future. Definitely. Well, I want to thank you both so much for your work on developing these evidence-based guidelines and for taking the time to speak with me today on the podcast, Dr. Geiger and Dr. Ha. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into the ASCO Guidelines podcast series. To read the full guideline, go to www.asco.org slash head dash neck dash cancer dash guidelines. You can also find many of our guidelines and interactive resources in the free ASCO Guidelines app available in iTunes or the Google Play Store. If you have enjoyed what you've heard today, please rate and review the podcast and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.